MSI $750 GTX 1080 Ti Gaming X is one of the most overbuilt cards we've looked at lately, particularly for its seemingly excessive thermal solution and use of 16 V-Core VRM dual FET packages from Fairchild, specifically the FDPC 5018SGs controlled by eight driver ICs for an eight-phase VRM with four MOSFETs per phase. As Buildzoid noted in our PCB breakdown of the card, the VRM is capable of sustaining a 250 amp load while outputting just 15 watts of heat at 125C. Even 400 amps would keep us to 40 watts of heat thanks to how much the phase design spreads heat over a large surface area and high account of FETs. Today we're reviewing the MSI 1080 Ti Gaming X for its thermal and gaming capabilities. Before that, this coverage is brought to you by the Computex Conference, which runs from May 30th to June 3rd in Taipei, Taiwan this year. Computex is the biggest event of the year for PC hardware and technology, where we preview the newest prototypes before they come to market. We highly recommend attending or following this event online for industry professionals and enthusiasts. Learn more at the link in the description below. This generation of GTX 1080 Ti cards has gone big. We have the Gigabyte 1080 Ti Extreme to review next already here, and that's multiple slots. And then this one is fat too. It's got not just the normal twin frozer cooling design on it with the dual axial 100 millimeter blades, but it also has a much fatter fin stack and denser array of those fins. So the fin density is greater, the fin count therefore is greater, and it's also spread across the entire card with partitioned base plates that we'll talk about momentarily. So it's a big card and that means it can deal with a lot of heat even though the 1080 Ti doesn't necessarily output that much even compared to a 1080. Yes, it's more. Yes, the power throughput can be quite high if you really push the thing, but this is a whole lot of cooling potential. So we'll see how useful that actually is and how it compares to the FE model and to our hybrid model in this review. And then the next review, we'll look at the gaming uh, extreme card from Gigabyte. MSI ships the 1080 Ti Gaming X, this card, at $750 with three configurable OC profiles through their software, and those include the usual OC profile, the gaming mode profile, and the silent profile, and respectively, those clock at 1683 MHz boost with 1569 MHz base for the OC profile. Gaming mode runs 10 MHz, or, well, a bit lower than that, 1657 MHz boost and 1544 MHz base, so a bit lower, and then silent 1582 and 1480 boost and base. RGB LEDs are present on the card if that's your thing, but we're more interested in the cooling solution. We already have a PCB breakdown and a teardown of this card in separate videos, though to quickly recap, we're looking at dual 100 millimeter axial fans as the setup atop the aluminum fin stack that covers the entire card. The heat sink terminates in two cold plates. One connects the heat pipes and the left half of the card to the GPU, and the other connects the FETs and the driver ICs to the fin stack via thermal pads. The inductors contact the fins via a thermal pad, not dissimilar from the update EVGA did to its FTW series last year, and the rest is mostly open airflow. The left side of the base plate contacts the VRAM modules directly, which then contact heat pipes. This, we think, is a noteworthy decision by MSI. Cooling VRAM with an independent base plate and contact the main heat sink is still uncommon and something we saw explored last year with EVGA's FTW hybrid card via the copper VRAM cooling plate that connected to the CLC and Gigabyte's extreme water cards. There's potentially an increase to GPU core temperature readings by nature of saturating the cooling interface and the cold plate with more heat from neighboring components, but it's not usually a significant increase and the decrease in temperatures on the VRAM is noteworthy and a more valuable trade-off than an extra couple degrees on the GPU temp. The back of the card is enshrouded by a back plate, though no direct contact is made between the back plate and the back of the PCB, which means it's less for cooling and more for structural support on this card, though we will have temperature readings without the back plate in the article linked in the description below. And also in the article below, we'll have a few things. One, the methodology for testing, uh, as well as a few more charts. So there's a couple extra thermal charts and a couple extra resolution game test charts in the article. And secondarily, a uh, couple of other notes on the testing methods. First of all, these thermal couples that are mounted to the card are pretty good. They are the, the pad that is adhesive and connects to the card is one one hundredth of an inch thick. It is laser thin. Uh, and is designed and engineered specifically so that it doesn't really interfere with temperature reading. So that's worth noting. It, these are built for this task. That's what they do, these thermocouples. The resolution is about 0.1C, and the response time is about 0.15 seconds on the 
thermocouples used here, and then we have more information on the chemical composition of the actual adhesive pad if you really care about it in the article below. Uh, everything else is defined there as well, in, including the drivers used for the testing, the settings of the games, although the charts will contain some of that, and then the CPU, the memory, all that stuff is in the article. But let's roll on to the thermal test first and then look at some of the FPS. Starting with VRM temperatures strictly compared against the 1080 Ti Founders Edition card, we see in this chart that both the Gaming X and 1080 Ti FE land their VRM component temperatures and PCB backside temperatures at about the same place. The FETs are well under any actually concerning threshold, which you wouldn't start hitting until something like 125 plus Celsius anyway, with the 1080 Ti FE card landing just under 70C for FET 7, represented by the orange line, or right around 65C for FET 2, represented by the red line. So those would be the FETs, one up from the bottom and about dead center on each of these cards. The Gaming X, meanwhile, shows its FETs, both shades of blue, at 70 to 71 Celsius for FET 7 and 65 to 70 for FET 2. Keep in mind that these packages house multiple FETs for high side and low side, and so they are quite dense. And our PCB analysis and VRM breakdown video has more information on that if you are curious. Moving now to a chart that plots frequency and core temperature versus time, we get a chart that's fairly complex and will be staged a few lines at a time. So it's basically three frames for this chart. For the first stage, we're looking at the clock rate of the GTX 1080 Ti Founders Edition, i.e. reference card, versus its own temperature. Note that the clock is enumerated from a power virus scenario, which means that it is lower than you'd see in a real game, but the heat load is significantly higher, especially on the VRM, and that's what we care about here for this test. The clock is a bit spiky. We have a range of about 100 MHz at times, caused by continually reaching the 84C threshold limiter and dropping clocks to maintain that temperature. The spikes in frequency often align with spikes in temperature for this reason, as they have an inverse relationship. And let's now add the GN Hybrid card here, which is just an FE board with an EVGA CLC added to it. Here we see the Hybrid card runs a GPU temp at nearly 45C, where the FE card operated around 84 Celsius prior to our mod. This could be resolved, of course, with a higher fan speed, but that's not really the point of today's content, and we already talked about that in our hybrid results video. If we look at the hybrid's clock rates, though, we can see that it is less spiky than the clock of the reference cooler version, and this gives us the extra 4 to 9% performance in games that we saw in our previous test, depending on how clock intensive they are. Again, that's in our hybrid deep dive. But now let's add the Gaming X. The chart's getting dense here, but this is the last iteration of it. The Gaming X is pre-overclocked, hence the higher frequency, and it is also the flattest frequency line we have. The hybrid card removed the thermal constraints, thus flattening the line, but immediately ran into power and voltage budget constraints by limitations on the card itself. The Gaming X will have those at some point as well, of course, they all do, especially with Nvidia's limitations, but they're pushed back enough to help further flatten the curve, and then the pre-OC boosts it a bit in the frequency department, partly thanks to the massive VRM, while keeping GPU temps with 50% fan speeds at around 68 Celsius. This is higher than the hybrid mod and lower than the reference board, which is really all we need. We're well below the thermal limiter point on the clock, and the clock is smoother overall. This means we should expect a generally higher frame rate, or at least better frame times on the Gaming X than the hybrid, but we'll see how that performs in games. Granted, the FET temperatures aren't really any different from the 1080 Ti Hybrid or the FE, We'll at least have some charts showing how this all plays out in a moment. Moving on to game tests, you can find the rest of the thermals in the article below. We're including overclocked numbers in some of our 4K and 1440p tests. The table on the screen now shows the overclock stepping. Ultimately, we had to step down to 75 megahertz from a 100 megahertz core offset and 400 megahertz memory offset to retain stability in all games tested. So while we were able to push 100 megahertz core and 550 megahertz memory in Fire Strike, those were not stable in all of the games. There's not a significant amount of overclocking headroom over the stock card, and you'll see how that plays out in the games tested. Starting with Ghost Recon at 4K, the MSI 1080 Ti Gaming X places at 58 FPS average with lows at 51 and 47. This lands the 1080 Ti Gaming X right around where our 1080 Ti hybrid mod performed, and this makes sense given that the hybrid mod removed the thermal limit of the FE card and provided an additional 5 to 6 percent of clock headroom pre-OC. Compared to the 1080 Ti reference card, we're looking at a gain of about 4.9% on the GX over the FE card. The Gaming X didn't overclock in any meaningful way, 
and landed at 60 FPS versus 58 for a change of about 3.4%. Looking at frame time plots, there's no meaningful advantage from overclocking the gaming X. There's simply not enough headroom on our unit when considering its stock shipping frequency. In fact, the 1080 Ti FE modded with the hybrid cooler allows for overclocking that effectively equals the gaming X in frame rate when under overclock. Looking at 1440p Ghost Recon Wildlands, the 1080 Ti Gaming X lands at 94 FPS average under stock conditions with lows at 81 and 78. This is effectively equivalent to our stock hybrid mod with a lead over the reference cooler of about 3%. This is, again, because we're not encountering a thermal budget limitation on either the Gaming X or the DIY hybrid cards. Overclocking the MSI GTX 1080 Ti Gaming X mouthful gets it up to 97 FPS average for a gain of 3.2% over the stock Gaming X. This is led by the hybrid that we overclocked, though not in a big way. Running at 1080p, we see the hierarchy remains mostly the same. The GTX 1080 Ti Gaming X performs at around 120 FPS average, ahead of the reference 1080 Ti in both FPS average and the frame times, and it's roughly tied with the hybrid stock card. Gains from overclocking are largely insignificant, again, and introduce additional frame time variance as the card struggles to maintain even a small 75 MHz offset. You can see in our frame time plots on the screen now that despite higher average FPS and more frame throughput overall, consistency goes down with the overclock, which begs the question of how much it's really worth it. With For Honor at 4K, the MSI GTX 1080 Ti Gaming X performance places above the reference card by about 9% in average FPS, with lows mostly comparable. The 1080 Ti Hybrid sits between the Gaming X and reference 1080 Ti cards, for Honor has routinely shown issues with frame time stability when overclocked as illustrated by the 1080 Ti Hybrid OC in these charts. We encountered the same problems with the Gaming X and decided that user experience was better with a marginally lower average FPS in trade for actually consistent frame times, i.e. overclocking isn't worth it in this game. At 1440p, the story remains the same. MSI's Gaming X performs around 138 average with lows at 117 and 102 putting it ahead of our hybrid stock mod by barely 1%. The lead over the reference card is more noteworthy at around 6.6%. Frame time scales somewhat linearly here, and that remains true with 1080p, where not much has changed. The 1080 Ti Gaming X is just ahead of our stock hybrid mod, operating at 204 FPS versus 202 FPS. This lands the Gaming X at about 6.3% ahead of the reference GTX 1080 Ti, running a 192 FPS average. Using Vulcan on Doom at 4K, the GTX 1080 Ti GX pushes 98.7 FPS average with lows at 81 1% and 78 FPS 0.1% lows. This leads the GTX 1080 Ti hybrid mod with stock clocks, which performs around 95 FPS average with our 1% low and 0.1% low metrics at 78 and 75. The 1080 Ti reference card, meanwhile, is closer to 90, making for a performance lead in the Gaming X over the FE card of about 10%, or about 4% over the hybrid mod with no OC. Overclocking helps the Gaming X push past 100 FPS up to 103, with 1% and 0.1% low metrics at 84 and 81. For Doom at 1440p and 1080p, check the article below. Sniper Elite 4 with DirectX 12 and Async places the Gaming X at the top of the current chart, where it runs an 86 FPS average, lows around 70 FPS against the 1080 Ti stock card's 84 average. It's not a huge or significant lead, but one that makes sense given the thermal and stock clock advantages of the MSI card. Nothing too exciting overall, though. And finally, Mass Effect Andromeda posts the 1080 Ti Gaming X at 69 FPS average with 1% lows at 56 and our 0.1% low metric at 53. This is ahead of the 1080 Ti hybrid mod pre-OC by about 5.6% and behind the overclocked 1080 Ti GX marginally. Overclocking the Gaming X card once again shows very little significance. At 1440p we see similar results. The 1080 Ti Gaming X places at the top of the chart ahead of the 1080 Ti GN hybrid card, this time by about 5%. That's roughly the same as the 4K Delta. Check the website for synthetic tests and Ashes of the Singularity. We've got Firestrike and Time Spy there as well. So overclocking on this card is really not exciting. We have our PCB and VRM analysis on the channel already. And in that analysis, Buildzoid shows where the shunts are that you can short on this card if you'd like to try and use liquid metal to get a bit more out of the power and voltage budget. Uh, but short of doing that, don't expect anything special with overclocking. It comes pretty much pushed to where it's going to be. And when overclocking is useful, the gains are marginal at best. It's maybe 3 to 4%. If you get more than that, it's a very clock-intensive game. Certainly it's possible, 
Uh, but in our testing with our unit, and obviously they vary GPU to GPU, overclocking is not exciting on the card. It's pretty much there out of the box. So that's good news for someone who wants to buy a card that's already at the limit and doesn't want to touch it in terms of overclocking. If you're trying to buy it, install it, and never touch it again, it's not bad in terms of the clock rate. If you want something to play with, really, sadly, Pascal is not going to get that for you in most cases anyway, especially at the high end where they're running clocks as close as they can to the limit point to begin with. Uh, so that's just a Pascal thing. Now, uh, this card being pre-OC'd as high as it, as it is does mean that you have more limitations in terms of where you can go as a, an overclocker in terms of headroom. Uh, but that's just the way the game is with these types of cards and this architecture. The $700 cards like the 1080 Ti OC model from Gigabyte and the 1080 Ti SC model from EVGA, which that one's about 720, I think, uh, those are appealing. They have an interesting price bracket in that 750 for this gets you, in terms of thermals, a well-built card, in terms of build quality, well-built card, in terms of clock, something that's pushed to the limit, but it's $750, and a 1080 Ti OC or 1080 Ti SC will get you pretty close to the same clock rate if you are willing to put a few minutes into overclocking. And that's just, again, how Pascal is. They all stop around the same point in terms of OC potential. Uh, so that means that you could buy a cheaper $700 or $720 card and get roughly the same performance. You might be plus or minus 3%, but if you're also plus or minus 30 to $50, it just becomes a question of, is that 3% worth it to you? That's something only you can really answer for your use case. Uh, but something to consider if 750 sounds a bit cheap, keep in mind the $700 options this time around are really not bad, as long as they're cooled well. The FE card has a damn good PCB and a well-designed VRM. Unfortunately, it has a cooler that for our audience, most of the time is not a great solution. You could get any axial fan cooling solution and not run into GPU limitations while maintaining a lower noise output. Whereas the FE card, sure, you can avoid thermal limitations if you're willing to sacrifice some of the noise department. So that means that things that are based on the reference PCB this time aren't bad. You don't need a custom PCB to have a good card with a 1080 Ti. If they're built on reference and have a better cooler, cool, grab it. Because if you can spend five minutes overclocking, you're looking at performance that's about the same anyway. But we'll be looking at more of these soon. The, the uh, extreme gaming version from Gigabyte is on the bench already, has been tested a bit, but not, not entirely. So keep an eye out for that. Thermals here are good, design's good. It just becomes a value question at 750, given all of those Pascal uh, considerations. And finally, if you're curious about any of our testing methods, the article explains them. We also have a video on what 1% lows and 0.1% lows are, which is methodology that we defined for the frame time testing metrics when we instituted those a while ago. So you can find that on the channel. Just type in what are 1% lows. Uh, and then we've got our Patreon page, patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly, gamersnexus.net for the website, store.gamersnexus.net to buy shirts like these. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.